Hello, everyone. Um, firstly, I'm going to preface this by saying I worked at a bookshop for five years, which meant that I thought a lot about the way we use those spaces and interact with those spaces. And um, saying that, a little thought experiment to begin. Um, imagine yourself going into a bookshop. It doesn't mean you have to be a big reader necessarily. You don't have to love reading and go in all the time, but you probably know what you're looking for when you're going in, or you know that you like the history section, for example, or that you like uh, biographies and, and you want to go to those sections, or if there's a review you read in a newspaper that you ask the person working there and say, where is this book? Someone says it's amazing, and they direct you to it. Now imagine you're a child in a bookshop. Everything's a little bit different. You're about this high, the shelves stretch higher than you can see, and you are looking for something familiar. You're looking for that book you got out of the library or the one that your friend has, something that's comfortable to you because you can read it or because you've had it read to you or because it's particularly glittery, just some kind of point of contact with that book. Um, but the child reader isn't allowed to roam in the same way. They have an adult there or someone there to guide them through and to say, that's too girly or that's a boy book, that's too young for you, that's too old for you. It's almost as though it's on a linear trajectory almost. You, you start in one section of the bookshop, neatly categorised off as picture books, then you move to beginner readers, then you move to younger readers and junior readers and young adult vampire books, and then you end up in adult. <laughs> And it's all on that line, and you're, and you're kind of pushed through it. So in a way, there are many restrictive things to the layout of a bookshop. Now, the thing about this is it doesn't only exist in, in bookshops. You see that also in the way we teach people about reading, and mostly in the way we assess readers. Reading comprehension doesn't mean, do you understand the themes of the book necessarily? It means, list them. It means what hat was Jack wearing on page 52? And what were the specific words that Sally said to Jack the page before? It becomes about repetition rather than necessarily conversation. So comprehension isn't the same thing as conversation. Now, I have to say, when I was younger, I was a big reader. But I found myself very frustrated with the adults that tried to push me towards the next stage. It was always about the next stage. I felt as though they didn't really understand what I was getting out of it because they were very obsessed with me becoming the reader that I had the potential to be, um, reaching a certain reading age, a phrase that still mystifies me a little bit. Uh, you get, often in bookshops, you get uh, children, parents of children who are six or seven years old saying, oh, my child has a reading age of 14 or I read my baby Proust, was one I heard once. So <laughs> you should probably be reading your child something different, but you know, to each their own. Um, but I, when I was younger, I was growing up with um, a book series that you've probably never heard of that was about um, a boy wizard who went to boarding school. And <laughs> there were very large gaps between the release of the book. Um, and in that time, I would just reread the current instalment of that series over and over and over and over again, and my parents would be pulling their hair out, and my teachers would be throwing other books at me, which I just dismiss immediately. Um, and then I found YouTube, which was, at the time, a new website, and online video was a very, very new thing. People had just started to use webcams. Um, they were something completely unexplored. Um, I would watch it kind of casually on the side and not really connect it with anything relevant to my life. They were just people on there making funny skit videos um, or art students as well who tended to be the ones who had the digital cameras um, putting together very well-produced things I couldn't even hope to create in my own way. Now, there was once a video that was uploaded by someone who's now become a friend of mine, um, called, What Impact Has Harry Potter Had in Your Life? I thought, oh, this is something I understand. This is something I know. And slowly, through the video response where other people can upload a video to YouTube, um, I started watching all of these videos with so many people, all age ranges. My age, most of them were my age group, because that was the generation that had um, 
really come to read the books at the same time and, and had all the other instalments come out at the same time. And this was uh, just before the final book was released. And I started watching more and more and more of them and had to find some way to take part. I had to be part of this conversation. And I came to realize that that's what frustrated me the most, the lack of understanding from people within my world about the enthusiasm that I felt towards these books, um, that I wanted to talk about them in a different way. It wasn't that I didn't want to read anything else in my life ever. I just wanted to be able to talk about the things I was reading with other people who were reading them. And strangely, YouTube became a real outlet of that for me. Um, and I started making the videos when my parents were out of the house because I was 15 and thought that they would completely disapprove of me saying my name online, which back then was a very, very big, bad thing to do. Um, and I started joining in with these conversations and it uh, quickly progressed to becoming conversations about other books we enjoyed and other things we enjoyed. And we would have group readings. Um, the nerd fighter thing that was mentioned in my introduction isn't about fighting nerds, it's about uh, promoting intellectualism and um, deeper critical thinking um, when we kind of approach the world. Um, so the same way as freedom fighter, the nerd fighter. That, well, that's how we like to think about it. Um, so from there, it became a larger supportive community. And I took that with me and tried to make videos of my own that were educational, but also just about my life experience. Um, and the same communities that had responded to me and responded to videos of their own had said, I've read something. It made me think something. Here is the manifestation of that. Here is my response to it. These were communities that supported me at other stages of my life, um, supported me throughout the stress of GCSEs and tearing my hair out in that situation. It's a lot of tearing my hair out in this for some reason. Um, and also, uh, more recently, when my father passed away, there were incredible, incredible supportive people sharing their own experiences again. But it all rooted in wanting to respond to literature and wanting to talk about it in a way that they didn't feel was possible at the time when they started and in feeling like their enthusiasm hadn't been shared by the people around them. Online, they found those supportive communities that allowed for that. And now, some of my favorite videos are rooted in books. One by my friend is all about how you should insult people using Shakespeare as a good point of reference, about you know, thinking a little more complexly about your insults um, and, think, and thinking more complexly in every, in every aspect of your life. Uh, we've heard so much, especially over the past few years, about format with the ebook. Um, everyone's very obsessed with how we read the text, but I feel like people are missing out on how that format can be used to make the book and its reading environments less restrictive, even when you personally don't understand why someone wants to read the same book over and over and over again. It doesn't mean that there can't be an outlet for that and an outlet that creates more things, that creates creativity, that creates chains of thought and ideas. It's come to be the case now that it seems to be internet or reading. You're either engaged or you're distracted. That seems to be a popular way of thinking about new media and social media. And it's often one that is used to put down younger generations as, as though we don't want to be engaged. Now, I have seen that to be completely false, at least within these massive communities of hundreds of thousands of people who want to talk about books, who want to talk about the news, who want to talk about popular culture, and who want to do so in a thoughtful and creative way, who want to respond to things with illustrations on Microsoft Paint as much as amazing graphics on Photoshop that they later turn into t-shirts, that they later turn into businesses, that they later turn into small empires and then larger empires, um, and that just become more responsive and collaborative and supportive. So I suppose what I would like you guys to take away today is that it doesn't have to be the internet or reading, or the internet doesn't mean distraction. It can mean creation collaboration and responses. Thank you. <laughs>